thing is, and that's what I call my book, that, which is a collection of studies, that, that what I'm dealing with should have been clear now from what I've just done, is the dynamics of being. Now, we're not used to using the word in that way in English, and in fact, um, other languages have two words, you see. And of course, if you speak English, you don't know what it's like to have uh, two other words. I've even written them down somewhere recently. I'm not quite sure why, but I did. Yeah, you see, uh, in Greek, which should be classical, and I can't pronounce it, it's two words, to-on, T-O-O-N, and to in I. Now, to-on is the thing which is, which is a being. And to and I is the to be of the thing which is. In Latin, that's ens and esse, two words. In French, letton and lettre, two words. In German, das seiende and das sein, two words. In English, being and being, one word. And so I suggest that one way of doing this is to hyphenate being and talk in writing it's easier of course. But you can still do it in pronunciation and talk about being and being, but <coughs> <coughs> just by hyphenating <coughs> I want to indicate. See the word being is a participle, so it's both a verb and a noun, it does two jobs. So it's ambiguous. So as a noun it's a name for beings. But it's an, as, a, as a verb, it's more dynamic. Um, and now, a lot of problem has come about this, because if you look at Heidegger's writings, uh, it, it's all about being and beings. Well, it, it isn't for a long time, then it is. And apparently, I only found out recently, he was the person who suggested that the best way this could be handled in English was to write being with a small b for beings, and being with a capital B for the to be. So in writings, you have being and being. And this is dreadful, because it's caused so much confusion. What he's actually talking about is the kind of thing we've been talking about here today, which is the appearance. He says being, and being means, what was that quote? Being means appearing. Appearing is not something subsequent that sometimes happens to being, being presences as appearing. So what he's talking about is appearing. And actually, although we haven't done this and we're not going to go, what appears is actually meaning. And so when he talks about being, most of the time he's meaning meaning, but in a very much more original sense. But nobody realises this. And if you talk about being with a small b and then being with a big b, you immediately go, oh, being... Wow, something overarching, overwhelming that encompasses everything. And he's not talking about that at all. What he's talking about is this very dynamics that we've been talking about here. The appearance of what appears. That's what he's talking about. But it's actually only relatively recently, because of this confusion, that people have realised that is what he's talking about. And people have realised that this translation has been terrible. So although I don't suggest for one moment that saying being and being hyphenated is a satisfactory resolution of this problem. It's the best we can do at the moment and I think it's far better than the very misleading alternatives that have been used so far. Um, that's part of I say, why these things have not been understood, why this has been missed. It's partly a result of that. So, it's, it's, it may not be satisfactory but it's better than other possibilities, and you can work with it. You don't, I don't, see, I don't think about being anyway, like I don't think about consciousness. I just think about the concrete case, the appearance, uh, the, appear, the, the appearing of what appears, the seeing of what is seen, the saying, I think of that, I don't think about it. Uh, being and uh, wherever consciousness and that sort of thing and also meaning comes into this but I shan't be going into that because that takes us into the hermeneutics and we can only do so much in one week and that's that uh, 
Now, there's another couple of quotes here from, I just finished up with another couple of quotes from the Gilchrist, which I think is quite interesting. Quite interesting. Uh, Uh, this is on the previous quote I did and then changed was on page 133 I think this one's on page 231 in no this is 230 the act of creation may be one of discovery not in the modern but in the older sense of finding something that was there but required liberation into being. Now this again is a fundamental theme of modern philosophy, that Heidegger talks about freeing things into being. They need to be freed in order to be. That they are there, but through, 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 through our seeing them, through the appearing, they, they are liberated, as it were, into being. This is his way of talking. And that's what he's... He's got the idea of here, there's an older sense that something is there, but it needs liberating into being. And then <coughs> another thing to talk about creation again, this is good. In creation, we are not actively putting together something we already know, but finding something which is coming into being through our knowing. At the same time that our knowledge depends on its coming into being. So again, that's a reciprocal thing there. I think I didn't quote those before, and I um, quoted in, in the writing I've done because it, it'll have to explain what he meant by creation so I, I wouldn't actually I don't think I would do that I, I've forgotten there was that awkwardness there it's only awkward if you um, it's not really awkward where'd I get this where'd I get oh I don't know where I am right okay obviously what this does is it um, means and this is, again is something that's gradually being realised that we, we are an integral part of things. Um, we live in a world in which um, things are not just as they are with us. Things are not just there as they are without us. They are there, but there's more. The appearing comes to us. You could say that things are there non-appearingly. And we find this very hard, because if we imagine something, we imagine it as appeared. So we can't imagine something that's there non-appearingly. And so we, we, we tend to overlook this. And what's gradually been realised is that a human being, as it were, is the place where things appear. That was how it was first put. But then that introduces a kind of dualism. That as human being is the place where things appear, it's a new dualism. Mm. And then we gradually realise that's not the right way to put it. That it's not that we are the place where things appear, but we are the appearing. We are the appearing of things. Not the place where things appear, but the very appearing itself is who we are. So we are intimately involved. And the, the, Interestingly enough, it's also now realised that if you go right back to Aristotle, you find this kind of thing there too. But in the Greek language, we are not the topos eidos, the place where things appear. We are the eidos eidos. We are the very appearing of what appears. We are the appearing. There is no dualism. Now for a long time, as there people have said, we are the place where things appear. And that's what Heidegger means originally by Dasein. But actually, we now realise that you have to go further than that. That in a strange way, we actually are the appearing. And of course, it also means that appearing is dependent on finitude because we're, we're not infinite beings, we're all finite beings. And therefore, the appearing takes place is always going to be perspectival and so on and that. But it is the manifesting, it is the appearing itself. It is the thing itself, not a representation of something. And, of course, we also appear to ourselves. Because we are the appearing, we appear to ourselves. We cannot not appear to ourselves, because we are, we're like King Midas with the gold. Everything he touched turned to gold. Because we are the appearing, we cannot not appear to ourselves. But, we do not appear to ourselves as the appearing. 
we appear to ourselves as an entity to whom things appear. And there is where the dualism comes in. And we can't do it any other way. We appear to ourselves, not as the appearing we are, but as an entity to whom things appear. We appear to ourselves as an entity to whom things appear. But actually we're not an entity. We are the appearing. And these are strange thoughts, and I'm not going to go further with this, but I do have a picture of them. <coughs> oh, I don't even know where anything is. Oh, I have a picture of all this. There it is. Well, that's a joke. Not quite a joke. It's a metaphor. Uh, if you catch it, if you catch it like that, that's it. Then you should tear it up and throw it away. Because the moment you start to think about it and work it out, it doesn't work. So really, it's that. Okay? And I wouldn't use the word consciousness. It's a book. And I wouldn't use the word consciousness. But there it is. And I like the bit. It's all dark and so on and that. And there is the appearance. But of course it puts it in the head. It's not in the head and all that sort of business. But it communicates something of the idea. Do you think it does? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, okay. It's the first time I've shown that and I was a bit worried about doing that. I thought it could get... The, the trick with this, as there's a trick with metaphors, is catch it. Mm -hmm. Now leave it. Don't start to think about it and work it out. And people do that with metaphors. They say, ah, oh, yes, but see, that metaphor, if you would tease out this... Never take these things intellectually. They're meant to give a flash of something which otherwise is hard to communicate. End of story. And that's what that's meant to be. <sighs> right, okay. Um, what shall I, shall I carry on here? Oh, what day is it? Do we know what day it is? It's Tuesday. <sighs> I'll see, how, see how it goes. Um, what I've just done, I don't know... It's, it's out of order for me, but I'll carry on. Uh, I'll stop. First of all, I'll try to stop whittling to myself. Um, because in the book I've written, I get to that bit where we could say, we could say that the act of distinction, there's it. And then I don't go into all of this. This comes in the final chapter. The final chapter is actually called The Dynamics of Being. This first chapter is called Into the dynamic way of thinking. And of course what I then do is I pick up in the final chapter what was in the first chapter, but there will be many other examples through the book of appearing, like in the hermeneutics, the appearing of meaning, which is the meaning, which is the, sorry, the appearing of meaning is the understanding. And then with that language, uh, language as disclosure, is the appearing of what is said, not created by the language, not made up by the language. Um, but it's a very strange thing in saying that it's, it's not what you, it's the lama. The words do not make up what is said. It's what is said is not a product of the words. At the same time, what is said is not there before the words and the words simply represent it. What is said comes to appearance through the words which say it. But they only say it because Again, it's reciprocal, that that is what they're saying. That is where there's a reciprocal. So you get the same thing with language. So I thought, well, then at the end, we'll have a chapter of the dynamics of being, which brings out the significance of all this, which is what I've just done now. So this, what I've just, the final bit I've just done, it, it comes in the final chapter. Um, and then people will see the significance of the dynamics of being. And I had thought of changing it and putting it in the first chapter. And I, I did, so I changed the first chapter, and it doesn't work. But obviously, since I'm here, here I'm talking to you, um, I can't say to you, well, the real meaning of what I've done um, comes actually a lot later on, and so I'm going home now without telling you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, and I still don't know whether I'm right or not, but I think I am. I've, I've had a lot of trouble changing this round. I'm going to just carry on... Um, Easy because I have another example, and I think I just want to see if you find this now easier to understand in terms of what we've done. Because we won't have just done this for the reader of the book, we could also describe 
the unitary act of differencing relating <coughs> as an act of articulation. If something is articulated, it has clearly differentiated parts which are related. It's the important thing about articulation is difference and relation. Did I say difference and relation? <laughs> That's English for you. If something is articulated, it has clearly differentiated parts which are related. As someone who is articulate in speech is able to speak distinctly and coherently. That's what it means, distinctly and coherently. Now, when, <coughs> when Goethe read a translation of Luke Howard's seminal essay on the <coughs> modification of clouds... He said that Howard was the man who distinguished cloud from cloud and he wrote a poem in his honour in which he said Howard had defined the doubtful, fixed its limit line and named it fitly. Now I, I suppose I really need to say something about Luke Howard here. This goes back to the beginning of the 20th century. No it doesn't. It goes back to the beginning of the 19th century. Um, Although this is the time when people had become extraordinarily interested in nature in all its different aspects. Um, and uh, one of the things which people were interested in, of course, therefore, was cloud formations, which are an evident phenomenon. And people wanted to see if there was some kind of pattern or order, as they would have said in older language, um, some kind of reason in the clouds uh, that's a Greek way of putting it but people did talk in that way they don't mean our modern sense of reason what are your reasons for doing so there are some reasons in the way the clouds are themselves it could it be that the clouds are just totally chaotic of, not, in, not in your sense of chaos totally, your sense, totally chaotic and so various that there is no order in the clouds could it be that there are many, 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 many different types of clouds? Or no types of clouds at all? And people, people were searching for this. And this uh, young man, Luke Howard, did actually propose something, and a, a talk was given on it in London, in a place in uh, the city. Um, and uh, the story is that when he gave this talk, most of the people who were there were in a hurry for it to be, him to get on with it. It was done at six o'clock in the evening, because after that they were going to a meeting of the Royal Society, which was just down the way then in Somerset House, where they also got dinner. And as everybody knows, don't come between anybody and their dinner. Um, but in fact, they said what happened was it was an extraordinary <coughs> meeting, because Howard was a very diffident, shy young man, did present this work on the modification of clouds, there was a strange silence fell over the place because they realised that they were hearing something quite remarkable. What Howard did was he saw that there were three fundamental types of cloud which were dynamically related. And these he gave the names. This is the point. The names. Cumulus, Stratus, Cirrus. Those are the only three names used. Cumulus, the round one, the Stratus, the flat there, and then the upper atmosphere, Cirrus. And so, which means curl. Now, to us, hearing that, we just think, what? What's to get excited about there? That's nothing. How could an infant body be bothered with that? What he done is he's just stuck some names on the clouds. It's a kind of um, framework he's put on the clouds. It's a totally superficial thing. What? What's to bother about there? But the people at the time, they didn't see it that way. And when Goethe heard about it, he immediately realised that there was something very extraordinary that happened here, because he had been very interested in the clouds, and he tried to find the pattern, the dynamical pattern, the reason in the clouds, the order in the clouds himself, <coughs> and had not been able to do it. <coughs> and he had so much background experience, that when he heard what Howard had done, he immediately said, whatever it was I just said, that Howard was the man who distinguished cloud from cloud. 
it says it very precisely and named it. So I'll carry on. Um, at the time, I put, it may seem extraordinary to us today that Howard's simple flag classification, cumulus status, etc., could be the source of so much scientific excitement and widespread admiration. At the time, it was quickly recognised that Howard had opened the door, which others had also sought and failed to find, to the scientific study of meteorology. But now we would look back upon this as if he had done no more than impose a system of classification, simply by applying labels externally to the superficial appearances of the clouds. But this is because we begin downstream with the end result, the system of names. Instead of going upstream into the process of discovery, to <coughs> glimpse the coming into being of the distinction of which these names are the expression. Because this I'm linking up with articulation in the double sense. That the clouds become articulated, they become distinguished, which means distinguished and related. But also they are articulated through naming. And naming has exactly the same function here as distinguishing. And people have often been fascinated by naming. There was something pri primary about it. How could anyone find a natural order in the ever-changing phenomena of the clouds? The very idea of finding anything fixed and constant in such fluid and impermanent phenomena seems at first absurd. Yet Howard was able to discern the hidden dynamics of the clouds and thereby distinguish three fundamental cloud types, which he said are as distinguishable from each other as a tree from a hill or the latter from a lake. That's his words. He was able to show that the teeming myriads of cloud formations are all modifications of only three types, where we might have expected to find the multitude or even none at all. Three types forming and transforming into one another according to the atmospheric conditions. As Goethe and others recognised, Howard distinguished the cloud formations not in the sense of classifying them according to secondary characteristics, but in a unitary act of differencing relating, in which types are seen as simultaneously different from and related to one another. We could say that in both senses Howard articulated the clouds, because distinguishing and naming are two sides of the same coin. This example shows clearly that the act of distinction is simultaneously analytic and holistic. Although, as we have seen, when we begin at the end, it seems to result in no more than a division into separate categories, difference falls apart, difference falls apart into separation, because difference, there's also the wholeness there. When we try to catch distinction in the act, we find that it is not divisive but holistic. Thus, when he distinguished cloud from cloud, as Goethe said, Howard simultaneously revealed the dynamic wholeness of the phenomenon, as Goethe clearly recognised. Now, this, this example, which I learnt of in the 1970s, uh, from the very beginning, struck me as having something quite remarkable about it. And then when I was working all those stuff on distinction, I realised that it was, uh, uh, I thought, a very nice example of this. But it's not easy for people to get into it because we are so accustomed to the idea that, oh, this is just sticking labels on things. That's all it is. Uh, it's no more than that. Uh, but it isn't that. If you go back to how it was originally, it wasn't like that. Um, and we can tell the difference by this dynamic approach going upstream instead of downstream beginning with the fin. When we begin with the end result of the finished product, it always seems one way, but actually in the happening of it, it's not like that. And I think you can see here that what happens here, what we have in this distinguishing, is the appearing of the clouds. Now, of course, the clouds are there all the time, they appear. But here, we, what happens is there is a new appearance 
that happens in in this 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 moment when he did this, um, and what appears is is this this this, uh, this dynamic order in the clouds. Yes, there's a very. I want to mention something here. There's a very useful uh, distinction Heidegger makes uh, between uh, being together and being together. Doesn't sound like much of a distinction. But if I pronounce it another way, the distinction between... I've just... T- just what I've just said is rubbish. Cross it out. That's rubbish. Um, there is a distinction Heidegger makes between belonging together and belonging together, not being. The difference is between... Let's do it this way. If I write it down, it'll be easy for you. I can then... It means I don't just have to do the pronouncing. I can do it this way. Now, so far, so good. But what we now do is that. So what we now have is the difference between belonging together and belonging together. Now, now, what says in the... Take this case here. Belonging together. Hang on a minute. In this case, the together is the primary factor. It dominates. And so the together determines the belonging. So, in this case, (coughs) things belong because they are togethered. So, what happens is, we together things, and that makes them belong. So we get things together, we say, right, I'm going to together you, now you belong, go on, get in there. Well, you see, we together them, and they belong. And this is what the system does. It's the framework. It's what I think you call it gestell, which is usually translated as framework, and framing. We put things into a framework. We have togethered them. And so now they belong. But the belonging is secondary to the togethering. But we may not notice all this and think that we've got it so they actually are like that. Now the other, which is really quite coarse, the other is more subtle. Subtle means refined. It doesn't mean clever. It means, uh, subtle is a word that actually means refined. It means finer. It's distinct from coarser. Um, belonging together. Well, now the belonging is the key factor and it determines the together. So, the fact is that things are together because they belong. The belongingness comes first and that's why they are together. There's something natural about this. With the other, there's something artificial about it. That's what you do, for example, in the tech, in Alpha Heidegger, that's what you do with the technological attitude towards the world. You're, to, you're to, togethering it. And all the things that we're interested in here are all on that side. And what we're looking for is a new attitude in which we come to discern the belongingness of things by means of which they are together. It's the belongingness that counts. Then I find this distinction, I came across about 1972 or something, it's in his lecture on the principle of identity. Don't bother to try and read it. Uh, um, very useful and um, been very helpful indeed it helps very much to understand a lot of what Goethe does so here what we've got in this case <coughs> with what Howard 
I suggest, is doing, is he discovers the belonging together of the clouds, which he articulates in this form with these names. We look at the names and say, oh, that's just a system of labels, which togethers the clouds and makes them seem to belong. But it's just a system. So that's the, the two approaches. The downstream approach sees it in terms of um, belonging together, whether together is the primary thing. The upstream approach, when you go back, is the belongingness. You see, they be, be, in the upstream approach, where you experience the, the distinction in the primary way, you see <coughs> they, they belong together in this way. I don't know if that's helpful or not. I'm beginning to lose it now. <coughs> <coughs> um, but I think it is helpful if you think it through. A <coughs> uh, couple more things, perhaps, to finish up. <coughs> this. I think th th this is. <coughs> I don't know. <coughs> it it just, just just goes a little bit further, but it brings something out. We can readily see the dual movement which differences relates. In the case of the distinction of opposites, for example, male-female, plus-minus, north-south, well, I don't have to answer really good, but male-female. In this case it is clear that each is what it is, only with respect to the other, so that they are reciprocally co-determining and neither stands on its own in the sense that it is entirely self-determining. There can be no such thing as an entity that is absolutely independent, being what it is solely in terms of itself, without any relation to what is other than itself. Every distinction, in order to be a distinction, is necessarily a unitary act of differencing relation, differencing relating. One movement goes in opposite directions simultaneously. Thus, difference without relation is actually unthinkable. Although we usually don't notice this and fall into the error of believing that we can think of distinction as just difference because we begin at the end with what is distinguished instead of with the act of distinction itself. In this case, we can appear to have a distinction which does not entail a relation because it is already too late. What we are thinking of as a distinction is in fact the separation of what is already distinguished. A distinction which did not entail a relation would be an absolute distinction. Hegel points out that such an absolute distinction would be self-contradictory. Because it would not entail a relation, we could not say what it distinguished. By annihilating the relation implied in the distinction, it would annihilate the distinction itself. Thus, an absolute distinction would not be a distinction at all. He says, actually, it commits suicide. That is a nice way of putting it. Of course, we often do think of things as if they are separate and independent existences. And as an approximation, it may often be admissible and useful to do so. The problem comes when we fail to remember that this is only an abstraction and that in the concrete situation there are no such separate and independent existences. So it's really very important because we all do think, we're always going on about the world is full of separate things, how can we relate them? The things we see as separate are separate. The fundamental relations, I've nearly finished, which any entity has, I'll start again, the fundamental relations <coughs> which any entity has to other entities, are sometimes said to be internal to that entity. That is, other entities enter into the very constitution of what it is, instead of being external to it, as they would be 
if entities existed separately and independently. In other words, any entity is what it is only within a network of relations. So instead of being an atomic existence, it is in fact holistic. When we think materialistically of the world as being made up of separate and independent entities, which are like building blocks, then we really have got it backwards. I've got a quote here. The attempt to rationally reconstruct the world out of a collocation of bits contingently related to one another is as futile as the attempt to appreciate a symphony by sounding each note in isolation and then imagining a relation among them. That's from Charles Guignol. These separate building blocks only seem to be such when we begin downstream. Whereas when we go upstream, we discover that the world is intrinsically holistic. So the question becomes, not how do entities which are separate and independent become related to one another, but how does it seem that there are such separate and independent entities in the first place? We find the answer when we go upstream into the primary act of distinction, where we discover that relation is intrinsic to distinction and that things only appear to be separate and independent when attention is focused downstream on what is distinguished. End of chapter. Um, I wanted to put that bit in there because it's just so simple. So much is talked about this and there is people say things like, oh, you have to go to Buddhism to do it. You don't. All you have to do is to think through what a distinction is and you'll find that this is how things must be. And this has been realised and uh, I'm going to put a bit more and I think there, or footnote, because actually in the uh, first part of his major work, Being and Time, this is exactly how I, or what's called the phenomenology of everydayness, or the hermeneutics of facticity, or however he calls it. This is actual being in the world. This is actually how this Heidegger describes the world. And it's done in great detail. And he describes it in terms of using tools, using instruments, and so on and that. How everything is related, and related to human purposes, and so on and that. And it's a con now people look and they say, what Heidegger presented then, this is in the 1920s, it, it shows that the world is a completely, he uses the word system, a completely holistic system. It's not how I've been using the word system here. It's also called a referential totality. Um, the language is not necessarily terribly good. Forget about the language in this case, very often you have to go through the language to the meaning. And here you can do it. And Heidegger actually describes there are no independent existences at all in his description of the world. Everything is related, internally related, to everything else. And it's an astonishing account of things. And again, this has been overlooked and it's not understood exactly what he's doing. But then that's part of the problem is that he makes it very difficult for people to understand what he's doing, because he had a different motivation. He wasn't trying to do this. He had another motivation. And the language he introduces confused everybody, because he took the, he took the language from medieval philosophy and reintroduced it. And this is this language of being, which completely confused everybody. So, and he did that for his own reasons. So there's an awful lot of confusion. But now, you see, later on, given time, things begin to emerge more clearly. And there are accounts of this. Uh, <laughs> I always said the problem was to get Heidegger out of the Black Forest because he was a very, very provincial German. Um, and uh, now they say the problem is now to get Heidegger out of California because um, <laughs> Heidegger went to California via the agency of Hubert Dreyfus. And Dreyfus wrote very, very influential in Heidegger's studies. And he brought Heidegger very much down to earth and brought it out in terms of his interests. And he, his lecture notes have been published in a book called Being in the World, which is on the book one, division one of Heidegger's Being in Time. And if you look into that, um, and for my view, you ignore what he says about Husserl, which I think is wrong, but never mind that. You look into that, you'll get this sense of this holistic system. There are many other books where you can now find this described, and people have latched onto us and even used the word holistic. 
and Charles Guignon, who was quote from there, who was a pupil, was a, was a student of Dreyfus's, um, a book called Heidegger and the Problem of Knowledge. He describes it in there again. Um, it's never easy. Uh, Dreyfus's book is actually good, but then it goes into far too much detail because he's a university professor giving a university course. Um, and it gets too much, but you can, from the early part, you can get a feeling for this. <coughs> and he's very, very influential because he's had people placed all over the place who've been his students, like Guignon and others. <coughs> but as I say, now people realise that actually there's a limitation in Dreyfus's approach, so that's why they say now the problem is to get Heidegger out of California into something else and so on and that. But that doesn't bother you. I'm just talking about this, this, this here. Um, it's quite astonishing. Um, funnily enough, this was picked up right at the very beginning. It's an astonishing thing. That Heidegger's Being in Time was published in German in 1927 <coughs> and is a fairly obscure work. And yet, pretty much immediately, people started turning up from Japan. Um, they were very interested in it. They recognised something in it. And... Um, they took back various ideas, and quite a lot of people came. And the first translation of Heidegger's Being and Time was done in Japanese. And I think I'm right in saying it actually appeared at the end of the 1930s, though I'm not sure. Now, the first English translation, or since I think it was 11 or 13 translations <coughs> in Japanese. Now, the first English translation was 1962. There was then another one in the late 80s. There was two. And so the Japanese were in there from the beginning that there's something about them realised that what he was talking about resonated with something. And they came over uh, and some quite famous Japanese philosophers came over and studied, met Heidegger, talked to him. And Gardamo was there at the time, talks about these people coming from Japan and taking this back. So it's really quite interesting, is this. It's a, it's a, this is something that's um, often not noticed. Here we have these people who recognise immediately what's there. People here can't understand a word of it. It's very strange. Very strange. So but that doesn't concern you. This is just a bit of by the by. But it's, it's interesting, is it not? No, it's not. Right. Um, I don't know. Have you got anything you want, questions you want to ask on this tour? Or anything you want to say? Yes, you have. Um, you were talking earlier, Henry, about human beings having the role of calling something forth into presence, as yeah. it were. So, is that just human beings? Is that just human beings? Yeah, what's your take on that? So, yeah. Ooh, heck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what do you mean by my take on it? Um, wh so, what do you mean by, is it just human beings? What other kind of being do you have in mind? Oh, for example, a uh, horse. So if a horse looks for the thing and experiences the thing, is it that same relationship? Well, or two this is a very things? difficult question to which I don't know the answer. And people are very puzzled by this. And people have given answers which are categorical and say, no, it's different for a horse than it is for a human being. But there are other people now who think, well, we don't know what it's like for a horse. Um, but um, it would be wrong to assume that it is just human being. But however it is for the horse, it will not be in the same way that it is for human being. So there's a general sense of the sentience of nature. And the, the, uh, the nature is alive. And maybe this is a function of life itself. Um, so although this takes a very clear form with human being, and obviously we're familiar with that, and not other things, that it is maybe something more universal here to life itself but it won't take the same form now I think that there are tendencies to go in that direction um, Heidegger answered no he said it's only human being that has world this is this realm of meaning um, because he didn't think by that that other things were just mechanical things or anything like that he didn't think that at all um, and he tried to go in and he gave whole, whole courses on the philosophy of biology, which greatly shocked his students. Um, and uh, these have now been published. You can see what's there, it's quite astonishing. 
he, he very much knew what was going on. The one, the man uh, who seems to be the one who was closest to this is uh, von Uchtkuhl, with the notion of the Umwelt. And it, I'm surprised that more is made of von Uchtkuhl, of course his books aren't available. Um, and he, he, he describes the, the Umwelt, the life world of the simple tick falling on to a horse and drinking its blood. <coughs> so on. And von Uchtkuhl had a big impact and it, it's very interesting. Um, he, tried, he said actually that he thought that Heidegger had actually got things from him. But and there's, um, I think actually if you look at Husserl's later work on the life world, that's Lebensfeld, um, I think I've, I found a lecture he gave in 1934 in which the word he actually uses is Umwelt. And now von Uchtkuhl was very famous in Germany. He was a, a bit of a renegade character. But he had a, an institute, I think, in Hamburg for the study of the Umwelt. He was well known. And then he fell foul of the Nazis. Um, but uh, the next lecture that also gives on the same theme, that one was in Vienna. He was supposed to give one in Prague. He did, yeah, that's right. He changes it to that's Lebenwelt. And if you look at it, I think really the life world which had a big impact when Husserl's work on this wasn't published until 1952 after he was dead. And Gardner said that when that work was published on the life world, it, it achieved an immediate impact with young people who seemed to recognise something and wanted something like that. Um, and that's all, I think, very much connected up with this. I'm, I'm rambling a bit. But now, the people who do... Um, What's that stuff? Semi, what's it called? Um, there's an article by. Semi bio. Ah, mm. that's the stuff. Um, Semi biotics. Yeah, that's it. Uh, what's the name? Uh, Daisy. Yeah. Daisy's got an article on this. Uh, I don't think she mentions this, but um, the people doing that are very keen on mm. on Jacob Oops School. Uh, and of course, there's another Jacob Oops School today who's got an article in the, mm. and it is related, but Hook School died, what, 1930, 40, I don't know. And I think this whole world, where it's not that there's an animal in the world, but the animal world whole is what we deal with. And then you see how there is this kind of responsive evocation <coughs> between the animal and its world, but it's not done in terms of this kind of appearing. Um, it's instinctive, uh, whatever that means. Um, and I think actually the later philosophy of Merleau-Ponty, which is phenomenological, there is a way of going about talking, he's working his way towards talking about this kind of thing. And he gave lectures on von Uchtkuhl uh, in the Collège de France, in Paris, in the late 50s. And he w was working towards this, uh, whereby there's a kind of general sense of life itself is, is like this. And then he, then he died at his desk before his work was finished. It was a great tragedy, really. Does this make any sense? Yeah. I know I'm struggling, because I, I, I don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to give an impression of, there's, there are indications that people are working mm -hmm. in, this, toward, in this direction. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, therefore, it's something well worth... Taking I certainly wouldn't do what Heidegger did and say, no, that's not possible, and all that either. Yes? Um, sort of follows on. Good. Um, I like So science as it stands seems to, uh, well, it does look at things as they appear in the, the static sense. Now, does, does that mean that science is barking up the wrong tree in a, in a way that... Uh, I, like it can't understand certain things to do um, because it is looking in this um, so belonging together, forcing things into a framework. Is that why science seems to have so many um, so much tension between ideas? I think the problem in science is it's a multi-headed hydra. 
I don't think there is such a thing as science. Uh, there are many sciences, and they're continually hybridizing. Um, um, there are different emphases in different approaches, and there are different emphases in different places where things are done. There's no one thing called science. Mm-hmm. It's uh, there are you to use Wittgenstein's phrase family resemblances between the different sciences, but there's no unity in the sense of behind them all there is something called science. There isn't. What you've got is he says like family resemblances. A photograph of a family. You can say, oh look, Johnny's got grandfather's nose and so on and that. Mm -hmm. And he says that's really a way to look at things. Family resemblances. And I think that's the more useful way of looking at science. Because we have one word. We think that um, there's a, we think in a monolithic way, there's a monolithic thing called science. So is that, but the word science is using that very same method, the naming of that particular uh, body, or so it's coming into the same, so science is putting all those things together in the same way that Am I forgetting questions? Well, I don't think science does put things together, okay. to be honest. No, but my, 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 the word. Oh, the, the word, I yes, the word. Yeah. Trying to do well, the word, yes, I mean, the word comes originally, of course, from the Greek, uh, scientia. It's a very old word. I mean, uh, the problem is we, well, science is actually goes back a very long way, long, long before Galileo, etc., and all that. Um, but now today things have just proliferated. Yes, it does give that because there's one word. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, it would do that. Yes, it's true. We do. We talk about. We introduce these words which become nouns, mm-hmm. yeah. and we then think they have to be attached to something. Mm-hmm. So there must be something called science. Mm-hmm. But there are sciences, and there are various different approaches. Now some are some are more open than others to different ways of thinking. Um, there is, of course, a very basic. Um, kind of scientific approach which I think is probably what you've got in mind mm. where people do work in that kind of way it's not subtle uh, in any way whatsoever but it would be quite different for example from doing advanced mathematical physics um, which has a great deal of subtlety in it uh, ways of thinking which are really quite remarkable but nobody can actually get hold of them because you can do that kind of mathematics um, but a lot of the scientific stuff that's done, what gets talked about, particularly in the medical sort of field and that gets reported on the radio and the newspapers and that, seems to me to be very low level stuff of the kind of thing you're talking about. I mean, if Stefan, talk to Stefan, he'll tell you how bad it was when he was at Oxford, how mechanistically ecology was done. And a lot of these things now where they do these correlations. I mean, it's rubbish, like um, the new one. Well, muscular dystrophy. No, it's not that. It's the other one. Uh, what's the one? The yuppie, yuppie flu. What's, what's that? M-E. M-E. M-E, not M-D, M-E. You know, this was all explained that this was due to um, the lifestyle that people had. Because then, statistically, people who've got M-E tended to be high flyers. They were working in the city, then they were sailing yachts and weekend and charging around around the world and all that business. So we got this. Now it turns out that it seems to be a blockage in a vein and this produces the results of ME. So but everyone say you must change your lifestyle because they did a statistical correlation and then they believe there's a causal relationship between them. It's bollocks. And there's many things like this. What's the one the other day has come out recently? Oh no! I was thinking about Stefan with, you know, ulcers. The thing is, I grew up with the idea that ulcers were a lifestyle problem. It was executives that got, every executive had an ulcer. You weren't a proper executive if you didn't have an ulcer. Uh, because, and the, you had to change your lifestyle, don't drink any alcohol, you're stressed, we don't drink alcohol, etc, etc, etc. Well, it turns out, it's a bug. It's a bacteria. It's nothing to do with all the things they fed. It's a bacteria that does it. Uh, there's a bacterium that produces ulcers, and that's what happened. But people's lives were destroyed 
by saying you must change your life and do this, that, and the other, and so give up your job, this, that, because we all it's actually a bacterium. And so that's an example of bad science. And they actually thought that there are people who write books about this because they're so angry about the way that, the way this is. Um, <coughs> oh, there's a chapter in Ben somebody or other, you know? Oh, um, Ben. Yeah, that, the book is called Bad Science. Bad Science, that's it, yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Uh, <coughs> that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Definitely. And here you get, now, you get an appearance which is actually a, a mere appearance and is false. And it just goes back to the other use of the word appearance. Um, it's something which appears to be so, but isn't. Um, yeah. Is it not that immune systems are compromised when people are operating under a lot of stress, and so the correlation might exist, might be, it might yeah. miss the yeah. point, it might well, miss the point to the wrong thing? You're going to be more prone to be affected by the bacterium. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So well, I can, I can buy that. Uh, I mean, I can buy that. I mean, my immune system gets stressed when I come to Schumacher. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can tell. Uh, yeah, I don't know why, but for, for some reason, yeah. No, I, I, I'm not joking about it. Yes, there is that to it. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying lifestyle doesn't count. But you see, one person's lifestyle, which is bad, there are a lot of high flyers who love it, thrive on it. You can't actually generalise. It's a crude assumption, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's a more astonishing. You meet people who are just incredibly busy and love it. Mm. You know, and well, they're not affected by it that, that way. Mm. There are other people who are great, and it's stressful for them. It's the stress that does it, not the lifestyle. Mm. Um, mm. As such, mm. it's the same with alcohol. I mean, uh, if you read, I've just been re reading the works of Patrick Lee Fervor, I don't know if you know him, he died recently, 96, remarkable man. And in the 30s, the amount of alcohol they just drank normally, People talk about drinking now. No idea. These people who were, I mean, they just, you know, they took, he died at 96. He was a very, very active man. He is the one who actually pinched the German general under the nose of the Cretans in Crete in the war. They were met by moonlight uh, business. You, know, you don't know about this. Anyway, um, I, every time I read about these people, I mean, the amount of alcohol they drank, uh, just socially, I mean, it's just unbelievable, the parties they had and all that, and the stuff they put away, and nowadays someone has two, oh, you mustn't have more than two glasses of wine a day. Well, for some people that, that's very, very true, but it turns out it's not necessarily true for everybody. Although I do admit that we have a problem in our society at the moment about it, yeah. But it's just that um, we always assume things are a certain way. Mm. But we do have a problem now, and we know why. There is a oh. Can I say something not about coming back to Jill's point about learning like horses, for example? About like what? About horses. Horses. And whether or not the you know, being the person is the observer of the appearing and therefore it appears. So um <laughs> Could you not say something about how if everything is differencing and relating, then humans are only humans because non-human, because there's non-human mm. beings are only human beings because there's non-human mm. beings. So in itself, it's a kind of insular thing of by distinguishing, you are by therefore by relating. And if human beings are human beings because there are non-human beings, then the idea that you only by being a human being can you bring something into the idea of appearing and by its appearance then you because because they're both together you can't say that therefore that would undo the argument that non-human beings could in any way not be appearing. Yeah, you see but what's happened here is this is what always happens in this discussion you keep bringing the word only in. Now, I never said only. I said this is what human beings do. I didn't say only, and it can't be any other way. 
you brought the word only in. What you're doing is, if you don't mind my saying so, you, you think I'm making a, a division, which I'm not, because I'm not even talking about the non-human world. Yeah. No, I'm not saying you are. I'm saying by All right. there was the presumption that... Yeah, well, there might be. But, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't say only. And I think, as I said, there has been a tendency to do that. Mm. Um, I certainly agree with you there. Mm. And it's not necessary, and it's not warranted. But on the other hand, the opposite is not warranted either. Oh, my cat, you know, is just like me. My cat understands everything I say to it. Well, it's not quite like that. Mm -hmm. uh, except if there any cat lovers here, I swear it is. I shouldn't be with that example. <laughs> <laughs> Is it your time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did I, sorry, did as what I said okay, or did I, have I not answered your question? No, it was it was more like a um, yeah. It's more about that. Is that it's it's both true and not true at the same time. Almost. Like yes. It, it it's both possible and also not. It's the same and not the same. Yes all at the same time which is I have a cat and I'm a cat lover but and I would say that on the one hand my cat understands everything and also understand that it really doesn't so I yes. Kind of yes okay so I, I mean I agree it is and it isn't uh, this is something which will be developed more in future but one thing seems to me to be sure that will be a growing sense of the sentience of nature mm. that nature really is alive and that alive means also being perceptive. Mm. Um, and, and you, you, but today we haven't got a way of talking about this. Uh, but nature, uh, <laughs> nature is not only doing, it's seeing. Um, people sometimes have this experience of actually, oh no, I'm not going to talk about that. No, I'm not. Um, I think this is going to grow. Um, I, I, I can't remember what I wrote in that Goethe thing that's it's in this magazine you've got here. Did I say anything? Oh no, it was in an earlier part. That article is not really an article. It's Philip said, can he put that bit in? That's the end of a, a long chapter on Goethe and modern science. <coughs> and in the earlier part of the chapter, I do go into this question about how modern science... Uh, withdrew from the sentience of nature so it's no longer nature, it's matter mm -hmm. and, and, and how this happened and why it happened because it can be understood and it's not what people think there's a, there's a background reason why, why it was developed um, and that it, it doesn't make any sense to modern science to talk about the sentience of nature but actually people experience that quite directly you have the book there, David Abrams, of course, is very, very big on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly so. And he's, of course, influenced by Merleau-Ponty very much, his phenomenology. Um, yeah, I was going to direct your attention to that. It, do, you, do, you know it? It's, do you know the book? It seems to me that um, we have a, a, a bit of a problem in that we are trying to use a word... <laughs> nature and we are ascribing another word which is a, a, a um, sentience as a condition of life um, but in our attempt to give sentience to nature um, we have a bit of a problem because nature is a whole and um, if we ascribe these words, nature and sentience, to it, then um, we have a problem, are we not creating a counterfeit, nature as a counterfeit? What we need to do is experience this thing that we're trying to give a name to of nature. Yes, I agree entirely. It really should come from experience. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that people do have these experiences, um, but we live in a culture 
where this isn't recognised. So very often people have experiences and don't know what it is they're experiencing. And they don't see that it's actually something very important and quite momentous. And if you do see what it is, you realise your whole attitude to nature will change. But they don't see that what's happening to them is that. Because the cultural background in which we are immersed does not give us the resources we need to recognise what it is. <coughs> and therefore, that's why it's necessary to introduce certain ideas, first of all, because very often it's when people get the idea, then they can begin to recognise their experience. Not foist their idea onto things, that can also happen, but actually begin, it can become um, an opening to their recognition of their own experience. So their own experience then appears to them. And that's, that is understanding. That's what understanding is. When your own appearance, see? So that's the way I would look at that. Anyway, that's it, I'm off for lunch. Can I have the quote of Lucy, please? Who? Yes, you can. I'll read it out to you. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> The attempt to rationally reconstruct the world out of a collocation, that's C-O-L-L-O-C-A-T-I-O-N, not a word that's used a lot, a collocation of bits, and bits is in double inverted commas, contingently related to one another is as futile as the attempt to appreciate a symphony by sounding each note in isolation and then imagining a relation among them. And it's a quote from Charles Guignot, G U I G N O N. And I think the book is called Heidegger and. Oh God, I know it is. I think it's called Heidegger and the Problem of Knowledge. Yes, Heidegger and the Problem of Knowledge. Okay. Right. Is that okay?